today we are in week seven of our series titled Seven Signs. And so each week what we've been doing is just looking at the seven miracles or signs, as John calls them, in uh, his gospel that he recorded that Jesus performed prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. Now here's what we know. Uh, John, John tells us at the end of his gospel that this was, these were not all the signs that Jesus performed. Uh, these were not all the miracles that he performed. Uh, but he specifically gives us his purpose statement. Going to read it one last time for us here today. In John 20, verses 30 and 31, he says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples. So again, he, he didn't record all of them. He recorded seven of them uh, prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. And he said, uh, uh, those other signs are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you would have life in his name. So that is our purpose in walking through these seven signs. It's not just that you would know more about Jesus. Not that you would just know more about his miracles. Not even that you would have an increased faith and even desire to experience miraculous works of God in your own life. All of those things are great. But most importantly, we want you to believe in Jesus. And as we walk through these, these signs, we want you to come to understand that Jesus really is who he says he is, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, and that by believing, you would find life in his name. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. You guys awake out there? You, you alive? All right. Nine o'clock was not. All right. I'm calling you out. If you're tuning in at 11 o'clock and you were, you were here at nine, you were not awake and alive. So uh, next week. Be awake and alive. All right, there we go. John 11, chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, open them up to John chapter 11. We're going to look at the final sign, uh, the ultimate sign prior to Jesus' death and resurrection. And while you're getting there, let me just say, uh, we're going to work through the sign here today. Uh, we do not have time to work through uh, the consequences of that sign and the aftermath of that sign. And so I want to encourage you, like I have throughout the series, to continue to read the gospel of John for yourself. We're, we're kind of picking it up and dropping in at different places along the way. But for you to fully understand this text, you need to read it all. And so uh, we're going to work our way through most of chapter 11, but it actually continues on through the remainder of 11 and into chapter 12, uh, just, just what all unfolds um, because of this sign. And we'll touch on that at the end, but for today, we're going to look at uh, the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. Here we go, starting at verse 1. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother, Lazarus, now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. All right, I'm going to pause briefly here, touch on a few things. First of all, uh, this, this Mary that we're talking about, Mary and Martha, they have a brother named Lazarus. Uh, we will read in the next chapter, actually, uh, where she does perform uh, uh, or pour perfume on the Lord and wipe his feet with her hair. You read that in the next chapter, but that's uh, kind of what we get about her here. And also, uh, this is the same Mary and Martha that, that Jesus had ministered to when, when Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha was busy doing all of the work. This is the same Mary and Martha. You're probably familiar with them. Uh, but this is really the first time we get introduced to Lazarus. And Lazarus, as the text tells us, is their brother. Here's what I want you to know. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were all very good friends with Jesus. Sometimes we can tend to forget that Jesus was a human being. And yes, he's fully God, but also fully man. And as a human being, Jesus just had friends. Like, I don't know if you ever thought about that before, but like Jesus had, yes, he had disciples, he had followers, but he also just had friends, just like you and I would have friends. Jesus had friends. And in the same way that you have friends that you love and that you care dearly about and that you would, you would do anything to help them, if they were in a difficult situation, Jesus had those same kind of friends. And, and so Mary, Martha, and Lazarus uh, um, fit that description. And so that's why they sent this word to Jesus. Uh, Lazarus was sick. And so they said, Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. That's a, a pretty powerful description of this, this friend of his. This is someone that we know you love and he's sick. You need to know this. And so when Jesus heard this, verse 4, Jesus said, and pay attention to this, this sickness will not end in death. Hold on to that statement. This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister 
and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Now, I can't even finish that statement because that's, that's really confusing, isn't it? Like, this, this is a close friend of Jesus's. He gets word that he's sick, that he's not doing well, and everybody at this point, all of his close friends know who Jesus is. Like, they, they're starting to understand this, this man has some incredible power. I mean, he, he healed a blind man from birth. This, this is not just an ordinary human being, and this is not even just an ordinary prophet. And so they know Jesus has the power to do something about it. They sin for him. And he makes this statement, the sickness will not end in death. It's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. And then John tells us that Jesus loved them. He loved Mary, her sister, and Lazarus, or Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. That's confusing. That's challenging. That challenges a lot of us. That challenges a lot of our theology, doesn't it? Like, why would Jesus choose to do that? If he had the power to go and heal this man's illness, prevent him from dying, why would he stay where he was? Because he loved them. It doesn't say Jesus loved them, but he had a lot of other things going on. He had a lot of other important ministry to do. That happened from time to time. There were times where Jesus was on his way to go heal someone, and then he actually got distracted because somebody else along the way needed healing, and so then he was prevented from getting there on time, and he still had to perform a miracle and even raise a little girl from the dead. That happened. This, this situation here, it simply says, Jesus hears Lazarus is sick. He knows he has the power and the authority to heal him, so instead, he stays put, doesn't go to where Lazarus is. Sometimes Jesus does not do things in the way that we expect him to do them. And in the timing that we expect him to do it in, sometimes that can be really frustrating for us. Because we, we show up with these expectations. Jesus, I know who you are. I know what you can do. And here is my situation. Here is my problem. And if you don't intervene, then this is a lost cause. And so I need you to do something, and I need you to do something now. And sometimes Jesus, because, hear me, because he loves you, sometimes he doesn't do it. Because he loves you, sometimes he doesn't do it in your timing, and he doesn't do it in the way that you expect him to. Sometimes he doesn't answer our prayers the way we, we think he should, and that, that challenges us. And that's exactly what they're experiencing here because of his love. So let me just remind you that when Jesus says no or not yet or not in that way, he's doing it from a place of love. And there is always more to the story than you understand. And so here, because he loves them, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Verse 8. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you're going to go back? So they're just reminding Jesus, look, there are some people in this location. I understand that there's a need there, but there are some people that if you go there, they're going to come after you. They want to kill you. They want to take you out, yet you're going to go back? And Jesus answered, are, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by the world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. And after he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going to go there to wake him up. And I love his disciples' response. They replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. <laughs> Oh, man, I love it. Verse 13, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. I mean, I just love how bright and smart and astute these disciples are, don't you? Don't you just love that about them? Isn't that awesome? Like, as we've been walking, even just through this series, walking through the Gospels, anytime you walk through the Gospels, you're just always reminded of just, like, what morons these guys were, you know? Like, they just did not get it. Thick-headed brothers here. I love it. And, and the reason why I love that, hear me, is because it gives me so much hope that if God could use them, then maybe, just maybe, he might find a place for me somewhere, right? Like he might have an opportunity of ministry for me if he could use guys like that because I, I fit this description more often than not that I just am not picking up what Jesus is putting down, you know, that I'm just missing it. I'm not able to read between the lines. And so, so Jesus says, our friend Lazarus, he's falling asleep, but I'm going to go there and wake him up. 
And his disciples replied, well, Lord, if, if he sleeps, he will get better. And so then Jesus told them, verse 14, I love it. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. <laughs> like, come on. He's gone, right? Like, he's, he, he kicked the bucket, brothers. He's gone, all right? Lazarus is dead. You're not, you're not getting it. And for your sake, I'm actually glad that I was not there. What? Wait a second. What do you mean? You're glad you were not there? So that you may believe. For your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, as I've been studying this text, uh, I've kind of found two different schools of thought on this statement from Thomas. Uh, some scholars believe that this was actually a statement full of courage, that he was actually making this statement like, yes, we're, we're going to follow you, Jesus, wherever you go, even if that means that we're going to die with you, we will go. And others go, well, actually, if you look at Thomas's track record and the rest of the Gospels, and he's not always the guy that's the most full of faith. So, so most likely he was saying this sarcastically, like, yeah, all right, let's all go and we'll all just be, end up just like Lazarus. We'll be dead. And, and so either way, I don't really have a strong opinion on it. Here's what I, I think we need to gather from this. Either way, whether it was a statement of faith or a statement of sarcasm, uh, he did not understand who Jesus really was and neither did anybody else. They didn't grasp it. So they thought, all right, well, either way, even if it's a statement of faith, it's, it's faith that like, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, but I don't believe in your power or authority. Now, I, I, I'll die with you, but, but I, don't, I don't really believe you are who you say you are. And so then from there, we'll continue on. Verse um, Let's see, we were at verse 16. We'll go to verse, verse 17 here, picking it up. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. I'm going to pause there for a second. So Jesus gets word that, that Lazarus is, is ill. And because of his love for them, he stays for two days. Now, it's a two-day journey to get from where he was to where Lazarus was, which is why when they arrive, after two days of delay, it's been four days since Lazarus was in the tomb, which means that almost immediately after Jesus had heard the news that Lazarus was ill, he most likely died. Which means that even if Jesus would have left immediately, still would have, they still would have found themselves in the same situation. Sometimes we like to control things and, and control the outcome. And God, if you would just show up right now, and God's like, you, you don't understand the whole picture. But also, as we read this, we have to remember, we're reading this in the 21st century, 2,000 years removed from its original context, in a totally different region and part of the world with different cultures and backgrounds and beliefs than the one that we find ourselves reading. So here's something that you and I don't pick up on when we see this. On his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When we read that, we go, okay, it's been four days. First century readers go, oh, it's been four days. See, the, the first century Jewish world had kind of a cultural belief. Okay, there, there was nothing biblical about this, but it was just a, a cultural concept or a cultural belief that when a person died, they believed that the soul of the person hovered over the body for three days, waiting for the possibility of some form of resuscitation. And then after three days, when the body would start to decompose, the soul would depart forever. Now, again, this isn't biblical. This is, there isn't like a theological argument. This is just a cultural belief that had, had worked its way into this, this people group. And so therefore, if Jesus would have showed up on day two, they might have thought, well, I don't know. I'm not so sure. Like, maybe he was just resuscitated. Jesus shows up on day four. The day where it's no longer possible. It, it, is, it is completely impossible for, for someone to be resurrected from the dead at this point. There's no way. I don't care what kind of gifting you have, anointing you have, what kind of prophet you are, you know, what kind of relationship you have with the Father. There is no way somebody's coming back from the dead after four days. And so Jesus waits intentionally after four days. So when he says to his disciples, I'm glad that I wasn't there for your sake. I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. He's taking them somewhere. Because he loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, he waited two days. He, he, he waited two days so that when he showed up, it would be day four. 
It's on purpose. So that they would understand who Jesus really is and the kind of power and authority that he really has. So that they would be able to stand and sing, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. The whole world is in your hands, including this man and his body that's been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, verse 18. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha had heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Watch this conversation. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you just really want to tell Jesus how you feel? Like, like, like Jesus didn't do what you expected him to do, and he didn't intervene in the way you expected him to intervene, and things didn't pan out the way you had hoped for? And, and here's the danger for us in, in our world. Like in this, in this 21st century Western Christianity, the world that we live in, the danger for us is that we tend to try to, try to put on a face and, and pretend like we're extra spiritual. And so when things don't work out, we just, well, you know, just got to trust God. Just got to trust God and believe that, he, you know, it's in his hands and, you know, he had a better plan. And sometimes we even say those things to people when they've lost something or someone. We say, well, you know, you just, just got to have faith and believe. And I actually think that the statement that Martha makes to Jesus is more truthful and more full of faith than the, well, you just got to trust God. He had a better plan. And the reason why I say it's more truthful and more full of faith is because she is just telling Jesus, this is how I feel. Like, I, I know you're the son of God, but you're also my friend. And I have that kind of a relationship with you. I know you and you know me. And so I'm just going to be real with you right now. And I'm going to tell you that if you would have showed up, my, my brother wouldn't be dead right now. I know who you are. And it's full of faith because she's actually saying, I, I know you had the power to prevent this. I know you had the power to heal him. And so, so yes, I, I'm frustrated. And I'm going to communicate that to you. I'm going to let you know how I feel. But I'm also going to make a statement that says, I believe that God is who he says he is. And I believe that you are who you say you are. Verse 22. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. So I'm angry. I'm frustrated, but I'm still going to keep trusting. Sometimes we need to just trust God even in our frustrations. And sometimes we need to be frustrated as we trust God. And there's permission for both. You're allowed to do both. And, and so, so that's exactly what Martha is doing here. And then Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Listen, like you, you don't get it. I, I understand you're hurting. I understand you're angry, but your brother will rise again. And she doesn't get it. Verse 24, Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus, I, I know. I, I know what the word says. I know my theology. I go to church. I sing the songs. I've read the book. I, I, I know the rules. I understand how this whole thing works out. I get it. I've got my theology right. Yes, yeah, I know you're saying my brother will rise again. And I get it. Yes, one day he will rise again at the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus says this unbelievably mind-blowing statement that we're just used to. But nobody had ever heard anyone say anything like this before. Verse 25, then Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asks this question. And it's the same question I believe he's asking me and he's asking you today. He says this, do you believe this? Do you believe I am who I say I am? Do, do you really believe that I am the resurrection and the life? And do you believe that anybody who puts their faith, their hope, their trust in me, they, they also will experience the same resurrection life? And anybody who, who, who dies in, in this life, when they, when they put their faith and hope and trust in me, they will also experience life for all of eternity where they will never die. Do you believe this or not? Do you believe me? And she says, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. 
And John said, These things are written that you would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you would have life in his name. John is taking us somewhere. He's been leading us on a journey. And here we are at the ultimate sign. And at the ultimate sign, Jesus makes the ultimate declaration. No, no, no. I'm not just saying I can bring someone back to life. I'm saying I am the resurrection and the life. It is in me and through me. I am the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And she replied, yes, I believe. I believe. And what I love about her reply is even here, she still didn't get it. She didn't respond with like, wait a second, so you're, you're going to bring Lazarus back from the dead right now? She, she didn't have it all figured out. But what she did is she took whatever level of faith she had, and she placed all of that faith in Jesus. She said, I, I don't have all the answers. I don't know it all. I, I, can't, I can't explain it all, but I'm going to take whatever faith I have, and I'm just going to put it all in you, Jesus. I'm going to trust you with it. And then from there, verse 28, after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, watch this, and is asking for you. So Jesus shows up. Four days, Lazarus has been in the tomb. He delays for two days before he even starts this journey. And he he shows up to see his good friends. And Martha comes out to meet him, and Mary stays put. Mary, even just by staying put, is sending a message. Like, I'm angry, and I'm hurt, and I don't get it. And if you would have showed up a few days earlier, I would have run out to meet you. But it's, it's a little too late, and I'm hurt. And so it takes Jesus' intentionality to pursue not only Martha, but then to specifically say, Where's Mary? Can you go get her? Like, I, I need to talk to Mary too. You know, Martha, you're my friend. Lazarus was my friend. And Mary, she's my good friend too. So can, can somebody go get Mary? And can I just encourage you that in the same way, Jesus is looking for you by name. Like, like, he, like, like sometimes, sometimes we run to Jesus. Sometimes we come out to Jesus and, and, and we lay it all out for Jesus and we just let him know our frustrations and, and we also communicate our faith. And then other times we just sit and wait and hide out because we're frustrated and we're angry and we don't want anything to do with him. And even in those moments, can I just tell you that Jesus, in his graciousness and his kindness, he says, where are you? Can, can somebody say, I, I, I need to talk to you. I need to meet with you. He, he doesn't judge. He doesn't condemn. He just sends for her and asks for her by name. When Mary heard this, she got up and quickly went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, what does she say? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Just like Martha, Mary makes the exact same statement, and she doesn't even follow it up with a statement of faith. She doesn't even say, but I believe, you know, that God will give you whatever you ask. No, I'm I'm just here to tell you exactly how I feel right now. You sent for me, so I'm just going to let you have it. You sent for me. You you wanted to talk with me, so here's what I have to say to you. If you would have been here, my brother wouldn't be dead right now. And what do you have to say for yourself? And I love Jesus' response. This just shows the kindness of God. And and it gives you and me permission to be real with God and to be honest with God. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. In this chapter of John, we we get insight into the humanity of Jesus, maybe unlike any other text in the Bible. Multiple times you're going to see this, where Jesus, because of the, the sorrow and the sadness of his friends, of the people he loves and cares deeply for, he is moved in his spirit, deeply moved and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. 
And then Jesus wept. Jesus wept. That was his response. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But then some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So Mary comes out to meet Jesus, and and she's not kind. And she simply expresses her anger and her frustration with Jesus and says, I had expectations from you. You are a friend, and you're the Son of God, and I had expectations from you, and you let me down. And if you would have showed up, if you would have done it the way I wanted, in my timing, according to my plan, my brother wouldn't be dead right now. And Jesus, hear me, knows the end of the story. What does he say at the beginning? He says, this illness will not end in death. I I understand I told you to hold that tension and that's a strange statement to make. We're going to come back to it. But but remember, Jesus knows the end of the story. What does he say to his disciples? Lazarus is asleep and I must go wake him up. They don't get it. He says, no, he's dead and I've got to resurrect him. I've got to raise this brother back to life. He knows the end of the story. And what does he do here? He doesn't correct Mary. He doesn't rebuke Mary. He doesn't say, don't you get it? I have authority here to raise your brother back from the dead. What does he do? Even though he knows how the story ends, he enters into the middle of the story, in the midst of the pain, and he weeps with them. That's the kind of God that we serve. That's who Jesus is. And so listen, for some of you who are here today, you're experiencing some pain and some hurt, maybe some loss, maybe there's some death in your life. Maybe it's a, a, some metaphorical death, just some, some really difficult circumstances or, or battles that you're facing, or maybe you've actually experienced death and loss in your life. And I just want to encourage you, Jesus can handle it. Whatever it is, he can handle it. So just be real with him. Be real with him. And, and the promise that I can give you is this. It may not always work out the way you expected. He may not always do what you wanted him to do, but I guarantee you every single time he will enter into that pain with you, he will meet you there, and he will weep with you because that's the kind of God that he is. And so in this moment, he he stops and he weeps with them. And what I love about, about this whole conversation between Mary and Martha and Jesus is that because they were real with him, because they were transparent and honest with him, And they didn't try to pretend like they had it all together and that they were super religious and and that they were just so full of faith that they they had no doubts, no concerns, no fears, no worries. But because they were real and honest with Jesus, Jesus was able to be real and honest with them and enter into that pain with them. And then the result was the people around saw Jesus' love on display. That's what happens when we're real with him and, and then he can be real with us is that other people can see his love on display with us. And so listen, there's room for that for you. There's room for you to be real with him and then for his love to be on display. And then verse 37 again, he said, but some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? I mean, they they know who he is. They know the story. They they know what he's done. They've heard about the signs and the wonders. I mean, we're, we're on sign seven in John's gospel, but this is far more than the seventh miracle Jesus has performed at this point. And they know he, I mean, he he opened a man's eyes who was blind from birth. Could not he have showed up and done something about this to prevent this? This is the the question they ask. And so then verse 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Pay attention to these details. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, By this time, there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. I love the practicality of this. John's not covering stuff up. Like, listen, death is is messy. It is, and and it's always hard. And and here, they're they're just being really honest about the situation. Like, are you serious? You want to open that? Like, he's been, he's starting to decay. Like, this is... This is not a good idea. There's going to be an odor. I mean, this, this, is, this is a really awful idea. This is going to be really traumatic. What are you thinking? And then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Remember when, when he asked her, do you believe? And, and she professed this belief in Jesus. But I told you she didn't get the full picture. Clearly, she, she didn't. Because she's still asking Jesus, what are you thinking right now that you want to open the tomb? He's been dead for four days. And so then Jesus asks her again, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? You don't have to have it all figured out. 
You just have to put your trust in Jesus. Whatever level of trust you have, whatever amount of faith you have, whether it's incredibly small or or, or a whole lot, however much faith you have, you just take all of it and you place it in Jesus' hands. And you don't have to know how the story ends. You don't have to have all the details figured out. You just trust him with what you have and then you watch him work miracles in your life. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they might believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice. So so let me remind you, as we've walked through Several of these signs, I've asked you this question, how how did Jesus perform the miracle? He spoke. And here we get to the the final sign. And Jesus speaks, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John is leading us somewhere. The sign is not the destination. The sign is a direction. He's leading us somewhere. Jesus speaks called out in a loud voice. He spoke and said, Lazarus, come out. And then the dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being present for this miracle? Can you imagine witnessing this? I mean, it's not just Jesus, Mary, and Martha. Remember, there's a whole crowd of people who showed up to witness this event. And then Jesus cries out in a loud voice, speaks, and and says, Lazarus, come out. And because he is the word and his word will not return void, Lazarus must do what, what nobody thought was even possible. He raises from the dead and comes walking out wrapped in grave clothes with his hands and feet wrapped in linen and a cloth around his face. And then Jesus says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. That's significant. See, there are a whole lot of people who've been raised to life but are still walking around with grave clothes on. Still walking around as if they're spiritually dead when you've been raised to life. Listen, it's time to take off the grave clothes. Jesus has resurrected you to new spiritual life so you don't have to walk around in those grave clothes anymore. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. So he says, take off the grave clothes and let this man go. And therefore, verse 45, last verse for today. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. The sign is never just about the sign. The sign is is about Jesus. And it's about drawing all people unto Jesus so that we would believe in him. The purpose, John said, for recording these signs is that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, and that by believing you would have life in his name. And and this sign specifically was not just about raising Lazarus from the dead. So so I want to make sure we're catching on to all the details here. This is really important. So, so on, on the human level, because Jesus is, is fully human, he's fully God, but he's also fully human. So on the human level, yes, Jesus cares about his friend. And so Jesus shows up, not in the timing that they expected and not doing it in the way that they would have expected. You know what I think everybody would have preferred? If Jesus would have just showed up before Lazarus would have ever died. I think a lot of people would have rather just had Lazarus never die. Jesus heal him, and then he would have never died. Can you imagine being Lazarus? What a strange rest of your life. Like, are you that dude that was like literally in the tomb for four days, rotting, and then Jesus, ra- yeah, that's me. You know, they had a meal later. They sat down at the table. Can you imagine what that dinner table conversation was like? What a, what a strange experience for this brother. And Lazarus still had to die again. I don't know if you know that or not. Like, he had to die again. What an awful thing, man. Like, thank the Lord that we only have to die once, and then we get to go to glory. Amen. But I I think everybody would agree, like they would have preferred Jesus just to show up and heal the man. But instead, Jesus, out of his love, because in in his, his humanity, he loved this man as his friend. So he didn't do it the way they wanted. He didn't do it the way they expected. But he still showed up and he raised this man back to life. And prior to it, he wept with them. He met them there in their moment. In their moment of weakness, 
sadness, grief, and sorrow, and he wept with them. Knowing the end of the story, full well knowing exactly what's going to happen, he wept with them. And I, I don't believe that Jesus was just weeping over their sorrow and over the loss of his friend Lazarus. I think Jesus was weeping over the fact that death exists at all. And, and, and he knows what it's going to take to reverse this curse. And so then when you think about it on, on, on a divine level, Jesus, fully man but fully God, he shows up and, and Lazarus is in a tomb. And there's a stone that has to be rolled away. And then a body is raised back to life. And this is foreshadowing exactly what's going to happen with Jesus. That Jesus himself, as as his final sign here in this gospel, is going to actually propel him. Jesus is raising Lazarus back to life is actually going to lead Jesus to his death. I don't know if you know the rest of the story, but this is actually what initiates the the final plot from all of the religious leaders and the Pharisees. I told you we don't have time to get there, but but essentially here's how this story ends. Because Jesus raises Lazarus to life, just people start coming to believe in Jesus as the Son of God from all over the place. Just, Just masses and multitudes of people start to come and follow Jesus. And the Pharisees say, we can't have this. We're losing control. And so they say, we've got to put him to death. So in raising Lazarus to life, Jesus knows that he is is guaranteeing his own death on the cross. And he willingly does it. He willingly does it because he knows that there is more to the Messiah than just signs. There's there's more to being the Messiah than just coming and performing signs. Let me remind you, at the beginning of this chapter, the disciples say to Jesus, are you serious that you want to go back to Judea? They want to stone you there. And Jesus says, you don't get it, do you? I have to go. It's not just about Lazarus. It's also about you, and it's about every other person. I have to go because I have to die on your behalf. I have to go and hang on a cross for your sins so that I too can be resurrected back to life, conquering death, hell, and the grave. Jesus says, you you don't understand, but this is what God has called me to. And can I just, just for a second here, challenge us, for those of us who have said yes to Jesus, sometimes we can get so caught up in trying to figure out God's plan for our life by looking for signs. And sometimes the way we do it in our world and and kind of our our very uh, coddled and catered to American Western society, the way we do this in our church world is that we look for the easiest path. And sometimes we we say things like, oh, well, you know what? I I really see a lot of favor here. God really seems to be opening these doors. So so I, I think this is what God has for me. And sometimes whenever we face opposition or challenge or pushback, whenever somebody tries to come against us, we, we, we automatically say, well, that can't be God's will. He must be closing those doors. And so can I just encourage you to stop looking for a sign in either direction and instead just start going to your Savior and saying, what do you have for me? And whatever it takes, whatever you've called me to, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to give you my life. And that's exactly what Jesus does here. He's leading them somewhere. But also, I want to go back. I said at the beginning, we, we, we're going to circle back to, to verse 4. And so I want to do that right now. He said, when he heard this about Lazarus being sick, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. And yet he knew Lazarus was going to die. So, so was he telling the truth or not? You know, actually, some uh, versions, some translations will read like this. They'll say, this sickness will not lead to death. So depending on what Bible you're reading, it'll either say it will not end in death or will not lead to death. And I think it's really important that we pay attention to the wording. Either way, however you look at it. He didn't say Lazarus wouldn't die. He said it won't end in death. So here's what this means. Death isn't the final word. It's not the final word, brothers and sisters. Like, like, like it, it, it's not going to lead to death. It actually very likely may lead through death, but it's not going to lead to death because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. If he would have just said, I'm the life, then there would be no resurrection. And so then things would just end in death and we go, wait a second, I don't know what to do with that. But he says, no, I'm the resurrection and the life. So you're going to go through death, but there is a resurrected life yet to come. And it's available to each and every one of you. But here's what that also means. There are things in your life that are going to have to die. And ultimately, all of us are going to have to die to ourselves. Listen, that's what baptism is. When we get baptized, we are essentially saying the old me is dead and gone and the new me is raised to life. 
And so I just want to challenge some of you who have not taken that step yet. I'm going to say it again at the end. But listen, you need to be baptized to declare who you are in Christ, that the old you is dead and gone. There are parts of us, and, and ultimately the whole old us needs to be dead and gone. And sometimes Jesus will strip things away, and he'll take things away, and it won't feel right. And it will feel frustrating, and we'll be angry because we don't recognize that he has to allow for some death in order for there to be some resurrection. And that's what we all need. We, we, need, we need resurrected life. We need new life. And so that's what Jesus is doing here when he says, this sickness will not end in death. And so hear me. I just want to encourage you. Because I understand in a, in a, in a room this size and, and in, a, in a church this size and with people tuning in from all over the world that, that there is some death right now. Like there, there is some, some painful stuff that you are walking through. Some difficult things that you are experiencing. And, and I just want to encourage you, if it looks like death, then it's not the end. If it looks like death, hear me, it's not the end of the story. And there is always hope in Jesus because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And this is the good news of the gospel. Not that we won't die, but that there will be a resurrected life yet to come. Not that there won't be hardship, difficulty, pain, suffering, and that we won't experience all kinds of just incredibly frustrating things in this life, but that on the other side, there is resurrection life yet to come. That is the gospel message because of who Jesus is, because he went to the cross, because he died, and he resurrected for your sins and mine to offer us new life. We do not have to lose hope. There is always hope. Even in death, there is hope. And so I just want to remind you as we close here today that the same Jesus who turned the water into wine, the same Jesus who healed the royal official's son, the same Jesus who healed the man at the pool of Bethesda, the same Jesus who fed the multitudes with the loaves and the fish, the same Jesus who walked on water, and the same Jesus who healed the man born blind, and even the same Jesus who raised Lazarus from the dead is the same Jesus today. And listen, he is alive and well because he's the resurrection in life. And in him, you can have resurrection in life. You can have new life. And he wants to continue working miracles today. And the greatest miracle of all is to experience new life in him. And so as we close out this series today, I, I could not end without giving that opportunity for some folks to say, I believe in you. I believe you are the son of God, that you are the Messiah. And, and I'm going to take whatever level of faith I have. I don't have it all figured out. I don't have all my theology figured out. I don't have all the answers. But I'm going to take whatever faith I have and just put it all in you, Jesus. I'm going to trust you. And listen, I'm confident we're going to see people come to Christ right here and right now. And we've already had people do it in the first hour. I'm confident we're going to see more because this is how God is and this is who he is. He is a miracle working God still today. The one who was and is and is to come. It's the same Jesus. I hope you understand that. It's the same Jesus that's working right here, right now. It's the same Holy Spirit that's moving in this place right here and right now and moving all over the, the internet, all over those who are tuning in online. It is the same Jesus today who raised Lazarus from the dead 2,000 years ago who can raise you back to life right here and right now. So here's what I want you to do. Just take a moment, bow your heads, close your eyes. And just ask yourself, have you put all of your faith, all of your hope, and all your trust in Jesus? Whatever amount you have, have you placed it in Jesus? Are you trusting in something else or in someone else? Are you trusting in yourself, in your own good works, in the things that you've done or haven't done? Trusting and hoping that somehow just the universe will work it all out? Or have you placed your hope and your trust in Jesus? And if you're here today and, and you have not done that, but you want to do that now, you're somebody who would say, yes, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to place my hope, my trust in him. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm just going to simply ask you right here, right now, just to raise your hand. If that's you and you want to say, Jesus, I believe in you, simply raise your hand. seen a couple hands. want to give time in case there's anybody else. If you want to place your faith in Jesus, you want to trust Jesus and give him your life, you want to say, I believe in you. And ask one last time. Nobody else is looking around. It's just me. And honestly, it's just me and Jesus who can see you. Simply raise your hand now. Yep. Yep. Praise God. 
All right, if you would, lower your hand. And now I'm going to ask everybody with your heads bowed and eyes closed to just pray this simple prayer with me. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you are the Messiah. I give you my life and I receive yours. I receive your Holy Spirit. I choose to follow you all the days of my life. I thank you for this free gift of salvation. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Hey, can we celebrate our brothers and sisters in Christ here together?